Our next keynote this morning is talking on advanced cybersecurity insights through the lens of threat intelligence, and it's Mr. John Stewart. Mr. John Stewart is the Senior Vice President in Cisco and both formed and leads Cisco Security and Trust Organization. When not dealing with trust and security, two of the biggest issues on not only Cisco's plate, but also on the plates of corporate boards globally, he advises or is a member of many boards of directors, advises multiple national bodies, a presidential cybersecurity commission, a cybersecurity think tank in a university, and serves on the Australian Department of the Prime Minister, well, did, maybe not tomorrow, uh, and the Cabinet Cybersecurity Review Panel. He was recently recognized with the RSA 2015 Award for Excellence in Security. Today, Mr. Stewart will remind you that cybersecurity must be the top of minds as businesses, cities, governments, and countries race to capture the opportunities arising from digitization in society. He will provide perspectives about the power of threat intelligence in combating cyber threats and how this translates into the art of what is possible when you combine leading edge cybersecurity capabilities with strategic partnerships, policies, and processes to protect valuable data, assets, and infrastructures. Mr. Stewart, thank you for sharing this with us today. I, I have to thank you for calling me Mr. Stewart versus John, because you know better. You should <laughs> say John. Thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation to come back to NIAS, and, and I certainly appreciate all of your attention for about the next half an hour. And as to the uh, situation in Australia for my Australia brethren, uh, I do know Malcolm Turnbull as well. So maybe, just maybe, uh, cyber will still end up being part of the, uh, the national agenda, and I suspect that it will. I'm going to speak about a, a couple of very particular items. But for those of you uh, who have been here in the past, you already know that in your mind, I'm going to get off this stage right now, and I'm going to start asking you what you want to talk about. So if you have a couple of items in particular that you're interested in, I actually want to know what they are. Um, I want to be able to concentrate and tell you what I can see in the data sets. We have multiple petabytes of threat data that we're studying on a daily basis. But like anything, this is your time. I, I am but one of 1,600 people that are attending this conference, and I want you to have the most value out of the, of the next half an hour. So what will you want to talk about? And by the way, you know, actually, you guys are fine. I'm going to the left side because they were so quiet and didn't ask any questions last session with Fabrice, and I thought he deserved a left side question, that now you're going to have to be participating in this conversation. So what do you want to talk about? It, by the way, if somebody doesn't volunteer, I'm just going to point one of you out. So it's not like you're getting away with it just by being quiet. So you're going to have to ask. All right, we're getting sort of left. Sir. Did you get hacked lately? Ahmed, did we get hacked lately? Absolutely, and I'll tell you how. I'd like to hear more about uh, known good network communications. More. Okay, more about known good, uh, points of demarcation, making sure that we actually touch on how to prove what is, in, in fact, supposed to be there versus what's not supposed to be. You guys are still kind of getting away with it. One person out of, there we go, thank you. Leadership, this is leadership. Future compromise. Say it again. Future compromise. Future. Trends. Oh, future trends, I'm sorry. I was hearing alliances and I couldn't figure out the second word. Future trends, perfect. Three very good meaty topics. Okay, so I've been doing, I'm going to stay away from the speakers apparently. Um, I've been doing this for nine years um, since we are on, uh, on shape uh, and actually in a small, basically oversized cafeteria for those of you who remember when we were back there in the officers club. And I've been always impressed by the fact that NATO's commitment to cyber has been consistent. And no more so is it important than probably right now given NATO's, that is not my doing, um, given that, uh, that NATO's role in the world has transformed yet again, and in fact, because of a dynamic set of conditions here in particular in both Europe and beyond, that the nature of cyber has now come to the forefront because of the next generation telecom uh, telecommunications technology. Last year, and it wasn't just that long ago, we talked about how in the world are we gonna be able to partner as industry and with NATO in the industry and commercial alliances that we're going to be building together only one year ago. And here we are having to review 
a year. So one year ago, I remember Ian actually challenging me in particular, and he said only one thing. He said, we have to go faster. But what we were talking about just then was first and foremost, how in the world are we going to be able to partner together better? Now, partnerships are a pain. Let's get real. Anybody married? <laughs> Anybody willing to admit that marriage is hard and then still be married by the end of today? <laughs> They're not easy because it's a lot of give and take. And frankly, knowing what it is you're going to get value and what value you're going to be giving into it is constantly in motion in this domain. It's very true in marriage as well, by the way. My point being that partnerships are not simple. They're easy to write down. They're easy and, they, and frankly to speak about and saying, hey, we're partnering, we're doing well, we work together, et cetera. But true partnership is where both sides are actually equally invested and both sides are benefiting at somewhat dynamic times equally. Not a simple thing to pull off when in fact there's so much going on. The second thing was, frankly, get to simplicity and innovation. Cyber is hard. The average number of technologies that have been installed in most institutions globally are well over 40. The largest number I've ever seen was 123 different companies in order to protect networks. And not unsurprisingly, and yes, I do work at Cisco, so I am a vendor in this context in some respect, it's not like these things all work together perfectly, seamlessly, smoothly, and simply. So simple was definitely a key aspect of this. And then the innovation side of this was a key part too. How in the world are we going to use technology to speed things up so that the detection and response goes smooth? And in fact, is faster than the adversarial technique is that they're using. So generally, I would tell you that I agree. And one of the things, frankly, we had to do as a company get our act together, not that I'm here to really advocate all of Cisco, but we had to get our act together on two fronts, using control points and getting into malware. Now, why is that necessary? I like to think about big, hairy, crazy, silly problems. Problem number one, how do you take a coalition of multiple countries and make sure that the cyber frontier of the networks that are commonly used in forward deployments are in fact safe for all of the country's participation? That is a hairy, difficult problem. That's this context problem. The second one is when information assurance and information availability is the critical edge of the effort in NATO coalition forces, which it is now today, then how do you make sure that it is most assuredly working correctly when you need it the most? That's a difficult problem. The third one that's very difficult is when you start to put on 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 different IP addresses on a given soldier, because of all the equipment, the systems, the software, and then of course in land, sea, air, water, and space, you've got a bit of a difficult problem. So simplicity ends up having to naturally be a part of this. I'm actually gonna not get in front of that next speaker, I'm getting nervous. Simplicity absolutely has to be a part of this because it's costing too much energy, it's costing too many phone calls, it's costing too many people's time to protect infrastructure systems that are necessary, needed, and the most critical item for the, the combat edge. Why? Because we're making it hard. We're all making it hard, by the way. So what we knew one year ago was that NATO, NATO was absolutely evolving, and the role of NATO inside of the world was evolving, even up to and including just something as simple as what's happening today as we're dealing with new dynamics in the political sphere. Okay, that was one year ago, 365 days. The real question you've got to ask yourself is, what is 365 days from now going to look like? Well, my, uh, my now former CEO, executive chairman, has a great saying. He says, don't confuse hard work with results. It's a fair point. When I was talking with my sisters, both of which are older than me, and both of which have claimed they are much smarter than me, look much better than I do, and are probably right on both counts, one of the points that they've always taught me as I was growing up was use data to drive decisions. So let's stare at some data. Believe it or not, think about it, 
multi-million, ten of million, or hundred of million euro networks are being compromised by a single email. The year is 2015. And a single attachment or a single link can eradicate the capacity and capability of 1 million, 10 million, or 100 million pr euro protected networks. How the heck is that possible right now? And I challenge anybody in this room, when you actually get an email, do you have any idea when you're looking at it whether or not the link that you're about to click on or the attachment you're about to click on is good or bad, and you've gotten to a place where you just don't even know anymore? I know I have. A $100 million protected network, and in 2015, spam is up. The amount of email being generated, including the amount of email successfully getting into companies, is at least steady state, if not higher. Now, this is like the beginning part of the problem. We haven't even gotten to heavily sophisticated, you know, zero-day types of attacks. We're talking about a simple email showing up on somebody's desktop that gets clicked, and all of a sudden, the game is on. And it's 2015. We made no dent as a world in this problem in the last year. Zilch. The good news is, what does that matter? Well, one of the questions was, did you get attacked successfully? Yeah. Yeah, and I say successfully because they got in at all. I'll tell you, it's unsuccessful because we caught them, and that's actually part of the conversation I'm going to have with you guys today, which is what we have to move towards right now in order to make a dent in this problem, significant dent in this problem in the next year. Now, what's the part of the dent that I'm talking about? I'm talking about if we have made no difference in, in spam volume, let's actually talk about the fact that we've actually got up 80% the number of infrastructure and organizations that have been successfully breached. So that doesn't look like success. You take a peek at the, uh, the internally related breach, and we're over 50% growth on this one. Move towards, of course, inadvertent human error, the ever so present, whoops, I didn't realize I did that. And we've got that well up a third, though I'm not so much sure that the second and the third category are not the same. Very rarely have I noticed that when I talk to somebody who goofed, they go, oh, yeah, yeah, I goofed. It's usually like, no, 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 it just happened. I have no idea. And then quickly run out of the room. And then the last one, of course, is attacked by somebody from the outside. So there's your second set of data saying in the last year, we have not made the difference that we needed to in order to stem the tide of what we're facing. This isn't all bad news yet. And just to be somewhat humorous about this, why is this possible that the infrastructure and systems that have been designed, have deployed, been purchased, and in fact are protecting our networks can be hit at that level of statistical success? And it's because, for example, in order to get by all the security filters, of all things, one of the very sophisticated attackers put novel information in the emails. And I say novel being somewhat coy, it's two parts. It was part of a Jane Austen novel, so it looked like it was legitimate email. And it was a unique way, in fact, to get email past all the systems that we're trying to protect against spam. That is the simplest thing to do, and it took all the technology that essentially was supposed to be able to detect it and moved it to the side. They put a, a couple of sentences from a Jane Austen novel in it. So clearly, we've got the simplicity thing slightly wrong. They, the attacking teams can use very, very, very simple moves, and we have to adapt very, very quickly with very complex moves. Which gets us to speed, and this is where the big part of today that I want to impress upon you has to change. So by all accounts, we improved in the last year. Here's what improvement looks like. We went from an average 230 days before detecting a significant breach in infrastructure to 200 days. Fantastic. We have saved a month. We are now down to six and a half months before we notice something significant has actually hit our systems. Phenomenal. Six and a half minutes might be the biggest problem. Six and a half days, most assuredly, has probably achieved whatever goal that was originally discovered. In six and a half months, you pretty much want to start over when you start seeing that kind of attack. 
So in the measurements world of data, if detection speeds are still this long, then there's not a lot of work to be done for an attacking team to have to change that much. By the way, just to be very clear, the attack that came against Cisco was from a foreign entity, shall we say. It was one of the more sophisticated teams that I've ever seen activate. It was done in a three-part move, part email, part web, part USB, the three triumvirate sins of every single network and successful breach. They co-opted multiple internal employees and then it had a goal of getting into our data centers to do exfiltration of information. The good news was that goal was not successful. The bad news was it took email, web, and USB, which is not too terribly a complex set of things to use in order to get successful, in order to get that attack done. 200 days, no, that is not how long it takes us to do it. So my thesis on this one is if we can start getting inside of the window of value where it costs too much to innovate, then the attacking teams are going to have to increase their amount of effort and spend and start wasting a lot more. What Fabrice was just talking about just shortly ago is we have a call every two weeks, let's talk about what happened. How about we have a call every day because systems are talking to each other and they're protecting us every six minutes. That's a very different conversation and that's another big and hairy problem that I decided I'd start staring at to see if we could change. Because 200 days, I fundamentally believe, is just not good enough. Do you agree? Are you still with me? Do you agree? Okay. If you don't agree, that's fine. If you actually think 200 days is fine, then, then we'll have a totally different conversation for the next 20 minutes. Here's what it looks like on disruption, though. So the information security industry that I've participated in for 25 years has three different ways that it works. You have a team that's off to the side called an information security team. And the whole organization that you're a part of says, the security problem is theirs. They've got a dedicated smart group of people, some 25, some 50. They're technologists. They probably use a lot of technology in order to protect the organization in their, the InfoSec team. Two things that most people think about InfoSec teams. Number one, they're weird. Number two, they're a pain. So that's model number one. It's the most common model I know of in organizations in talking to our customers. They have an InfoSec team, and it's their responsibility to protect us. Kind of like having the police force. It's their responsibility to protect us and then abdicating, locking your door. Okay, model number one. It's been successful to a certain degree for a certain period of time. It is by no means successful at the moment on its own. Model number two. Few organizations have gotten to here. Embed the security functions and still have a team that's doing operations, but embed the security needs closer to the networking team, the systems team, and the applications team inside of the IT organization closer. It doesn't mean an InfoSec team goes away completely, but it means that you've doubled up and said the people that are changing the systems that you're trying to protect anyway should actually understand what it is that you're worried about and have the security of it protected too. It's model number two. 99 to 1% basically is the math between model one and model two. And very rarely, almost to the point of sub 1%, so if you have a tiny little noise on this one, I could say 99.9 and 0.1. Do you have an organization that actually woke up and realized that if it's going to have a mission, it better have cybersecurity as a part of the mission by the time it decides to have the mission at all? You wanna sell something? Cybersecurity's got a piece of it because you got data of customers. You want to run something? Cybersecurity's got it because you're actually operating it for somebody else. You want to build something, deploy it, send it overseas, put it on a ship. It's got to have cyber as a part of it because the mission force that you've got actually needs the IT systems, so cyber is a piece of this, period. Now we're in the like rarefied air of you, want, you sort of run into one of these probably once in your lifetime so far. The evolution of this has got to get to step three. And I know it's, it sounds sort of coy 
to say security and everything, security embedded, all that kind of other stuff. But if the data is showing that the existing models that we have right now are not working, then isn't it about time to try something new? And by the way, I don't want security teams to feel victim anymore. You know, the business said we're doing this, or the leadership said we're doing this. I don't think any business leader or any leader in any organization, including here at NATO, woke up and said, you know what I'm really trying to tell you is I want to have the mission work really well until it all goes wrong because of some sort of cyber breach. That's not what they think. On the other hand, the education in reverse has got to be like, look, you can't just think about mission absent IT and cyber. Not going to work anymore. Days are long gone. You want to do the most interesting exercise? Run an exercise of any type and then use cyber to disrupt the thing and it'll stop within a couple of minutes. Pretty good example, and I think I've alluded to this to a couple of you in the past. We did an exercise in Cisco and I was told, create a cyber problem. It was a disaster and resiliency exercise. It was about data center failover. You know what I did? I turned off the online phone directory. Everybody's phone could no longer figure out who to call. And by the time the whole discussion was, we need to call this person, this person, and this person, and bring this person, this person, and this person in, nobody had a printed copy of this, at which point the whole exercise stopped six minutes into the beginning of it. Now, what my team had thought I was going to do, and by that I mean the executive team, they thought I was going to create some sort of advanced persistent threat from a nation state from somewhere else in the world, and I was going to call it Canada just for giggles. But Sorry for the Canadians in the room. Um, but look how simple it was to disrupt the whole operation. And that's why, in fact, the nature of the resiliency of cyber has to be a part of all parts of business. I've had this proven. Good to see you, sir. I've had this proven that I can see everything coming into our company and attacking our infrastructure in less than two days. I've had this proven by multiple countries. So it's not like we just self-prove it and go, cool, we're done. I know it can be done. So if it can be done, then the question, of course, is how? And by the way, two days is still too long. Still way too long. But it can be done. Here's how. This took six years to build. So it's not as if this is going to be like start today and we're going to be done tomorrow. This took six hard working years since 2009 to get to the place where I pushed the team and said, okay, we've got to get less than two days. And what it takes is an incredible amount of data analytics. If you want to know the team that knows how to do data analytics the best, it's most, it, usually in most businesses, it's business intelligence teams. In most militaries, it's combat tactics teams where they understand data. So it can be done. And part of the reason it can be done is because it needs to be done. And now, as I stand in front of you today, what's happened is we've moved it to a place where there's two petabytes of data that we are keeping near line, and we're running over and over again to see if something happened yesterday we didn't know yesterday so that we know it today. The compute power is not trivial, and the commitment to it is not small. The reason that we had to do this is because, frankly, things are going to happen in every company, ours included, and we decided that the only way we're going to be able to protect the place is if we constantly are watching on all sorts of angles. Now, when I say all sorts of angles, let me give you an example. DNS traffic, fantastic way to determine if you've got an adversary in your network. NetFlow data, same thing. Active Directory data, pretty interesting as well. Filled logins, fantastic source that you're actually having an attack inside your company. I've changed the entire purpose of our security operations group to do nothing but data analysis. They don't run firewalls anymore. They don't run IPSs anymore. They don't run pretty much any of the infrastructure systems because they have to hunt, they have to search, and they have to keep it below two days. Big surprise, now it's going to be less than one day. I mean, we're just going to keep pushing this envelope and I'll hopefully in a year be able to tell you we're less than a day. But when you ask the question, have we been breached? And I said, yes. 
We knew it within 48 hours. We actually knew it within 12. And this is one of the most sophisticated teams by all folks that I talk to, and I don't think it's luck that we've actually gotten here. Now, don't get me wrong, there's other ways by which we intend to actually make this all part of your lives, where I don't want it just for us, because that's not really been my interest. It's important to help protect the company, that's great, but how in the world am I actually gonna get it to the point where you get to benefit? And so I said that DNS traffic was kind of interesting. So there's a company called OpenDNS, many of you may know them. Uh, they're based in San Francisco. Dave Olivek and I have known each other for a long time. And he is a control point. He's a control point for detection and response. DNS traffic being a rich source of how to catch adversaries of almost every type. And by the way, almost every device we use needs DNS in one way, shape, or form. Then it's a terrific, rich source of data. They see 70 billion DNS requests a day and are able to articulate which ones are good and which ones are bad. So long before a web browser is involved, long before an attachment gets infected, long before something actually gets to a place where it's bad and it's starting to activate, they know what known good is. And that's part one to the answer of the second question I was asked. They actually can assert if a computer should not talk to something else and reduce the chances that it does. Over 10,000 enterprise customers are benefiting from this, and individual users are now well over 65 million, and that's a company on its own. You can bet dimes to donuts with a $49 billion corporation called Cisco, this is gonna go out in a lot more places, and the growth of this is gonna go much higher. This is where the world gets to benefit, including all of you. By the way, I use it at home. And I say that because I'm gonna introduce something that I think is important also to know, which is we're not just about a vendor building things to make money. You can use OpenDNS's services just by changing your home IP addresses on DNS to this. So part one, there's giving back to the world. Let me give you part two. So I've oftentimes been challenged and I suspect many of you think the same thing. It's like, do you guys even do security at Cisco? Like, do you build stuff? And you're not a security company, you're that networking company I keep hearing about. 2.4 billion in annualized revenue in security, I think we kind of do it. We're probably the first, if not the second, somewhere in that, in that fight, largest security vendor in the world. We just don't necessarily do a great job marketing it. But one of the things we didn't have was any ability to do malware, reverse analysis, detection, et cetera. So you may have noticed Cisco has a tendency to acquire companies. This has sort of been a little obvious. We're up to about 160 of them. And we bought into an idea that helps all law enforcement teams, and by the way, helps any one of you in the IA world, where we can do malware analysis in a cloud-based format. So today, we're handling hundreds of thousands of pieces of malware a day to determine what is good and what is bad. Virus total is one of the ways you guys get to benefit from that for free. If you're in a law enforcement role, you get to benefit for free as well because we've offered that up to law enforcement teams for free. So again, trying to reduce the footprint and switching back to 48 hours of disruption and causing this to be harder for the adversaries has got to be our goal. And that's where the second move was. Interestingly enough, by the way, Malware is kind of a strange thing. You don't even know if it's good or it's bad until probably too late. So if you didn't know today that something was wrong, how about rerunning it tomorrow and finding out if it is? It's an interesting notion. That's part of the reason we keep that two petabytes of data is because tomorrow we might actually learn something that we're going to need to know in order to fix what happened today. Click. I could not agree more with multiple speeches today around trust. And I have had it up to here over the idea that we can't trust each other. I don't know a single reason why anybody in this room can't trust the other one, because at the moment, you're all trusting each other not to go crazy while you're sitting listening to my speech. You're all sitting very calmly, very politely, very nicely, except for you maybe. The point is, if we can't trust each other by default, what in the heck are we doing? 
I see no value at all in doing anything except publishing every IOC we can find on the open internet as quickly as possible. Just mess with the other group. I've been told, oh gosh, you know, I, I can't share this IOC with a group because I'm not so sure where if they're going to share it and then maybe, you know, the adversaries will then pick up on it. Great! Absolutely make sure the adversaries pick up on the IOCs that we've got. That way they have to go build another one. It wastes their time. One of the largest monitored blogs right now is something called the Talos blog. It's our research team that's doing nothing but publishing every single IOC we can come up with. Everything we see in all of this data, we're publishing it openly as fast as possible because we have totally shifted gears and said it's not about actually trusting you with the information or not. It's actually making sure the world knows it so, in fact, it causes the adversaries pain. That's the mode we should be shifting into so we get less than 24 hours and 48 hours. But the other thing I'm going to challenge NATO and all of you about is this isn't just about a discussion on information and analytics, whitelisting, trends. This is also about a whole debate over who builds and who runs. And having gotten the joyous experiences over the last couple of years about being asked as a U.S. headquartered company how we build and run and develop and the like, and whether or not we put backdoors in our products and whether or not we're deliberately manipulating the internet. One of the things I began to realize was, if we're going to talk about trust, and I'm going to say trust each other, then one of the key parts about trust is saying who you are and what your principles are and what you're going to stand up and be. And I, I don't think I fully put that together. Because I, you know, I generally sort of think, you know, if you're trustworthy, you're trustworthy. You don't have to say what that means but I was wrong. And so to trust is also to put up your core principles in front of any audience and say, this is who we are and this is what we will be. And so starting in April of this year, we launched a website called trust.cisco.com specifically for that purpose. And it includes a whole host of things, but the three most important parts of this trust, uh, trustworthy, transparent, and accountable piece so when I say trust each other, I think another part of it is, and most assuredly, how we actually get accountable for making sure we make this better. My challenge? There's this thing called low cost, technically acceptable. I love this phrase. The dilemma has become that for a great number of organizations worldwide, it means whatever feature that I need equals that's good enough and I'll buy it. The truth of it is when you're betting your life on infrastructure, it better be more than just it does what I needed it to do and who cares how it was built. Let me give you a way to make this personal. God forbid any of you have to go to the hospital. But when you do these days and you go into a room that's got some sort of device that's about to work on you or test you or touch you or affect you or laser you or whatever it is that has to be done, do you want to actually know, A, was that device low cost, technically acceptable, or B, built in such a way that in fact it's got an odds on even chance of not being infected by malware at the moment? I joke about this with my engineers quite a bit. I say, if you actually got on the operating table and you saw a Cisco router next to it and you're the one that built it, would you jump off the table or would you stay on the table? Essentially being, the definition of acceptable had best be about how it's built just as much as what it does. And that has to change in our industry. It can't be just, I'll buy whatever I need at lowest cost possible and if it's got a switch port that does 100 meg, great. It's not, it's not good enough anymore. We're doing this anyway. Now it's about being partners, about trusting each other that we're doing it for the right reasons. So that's the challenge I'm going to leave behind because it's one of the three things that I need today from all of you here. Duplicate everything we've done. 
We've shared it publicly. We've got the entire data architecture. It's open, uh, open source. It's, it's basically been published. Get to a place where less than six hours detection is possible in every single organization that you all work with and making NATO successful and doing precisely the same every single chance you come and do. Break some glass on this one. Publish IOCs openly. If you find them, publish them. Put them out there on the internet. They'll be searchable pretty fast. There's this entire project uh, called the Open IOC Project, where we've actually gotten unique named IDs where you can open source the information and tell the world that there's an IOC that's active. So do it. Screw with the adversaries. It's driving us crazy that they're continuing to develop faster than we do. Go to step three. Force every organization that we are a part of to embed cyber's needs at the beginning, not retrofit it at the end. I'm pushing Cisco straight this direction, and by the way, it's painful as all get out. But I went straight up and then got, this is, be careful of this one. I, I said this seemed like a good idea for evolving, and the next thing I had was four different Cisco's board meetings um, in order to talk about why. So it will create work, but I promise you on the other side of this, it'll be better. And then the last one, of course, let's push security and trust into the buy time decisions. It should have been a long time ago. I've actually started forcing every vendor in our company that's providing technology to start talking to us about how they're developing it and make that early indication that it better be developed with security in mind. And it better have the ability to be patched and fixed and upgraded and altered. Why? Why am I asking for these three in particular? It actually goes to the three questions that were asked. So the trend lines conversation is all about we're putting 10x devices in the next five years on the internet, more than we have today. It's going to be refrigerators, it's going to be light bulbs, it's going to be lighting systems, it's going to be cars, it's going to be televisions, it's going to be radios, you name it. And the current trend line, unless it's changed, is going to include more weak systems on the internet than we have today. And we already have a number of them that are pretty weak. My second trend line is that every business that I know of depends on IT. Not uses it, depends on it which means we had better design it, build it, and assure it that it actually can be done correctly. On the whole notion around whitelisting, and the whole notion about known good, this is why so many of these systems are allowing what's known good because they've consolidated the data globally to know what's good and what's bad, permit what's known good, and stop with known bad. There are systems now that are using hardware and software, digitally signed software, to know that it was the vendor, make sure that it was done correctly, make sure it's booting up correctly. And I'll tell you, all of that's great technology. It isn't deployed in statistically high enough ways yet in order to be used. TPM chips, think of it in the internet world. That's sort of next version. But it's possible. You know what's in fact supposed to be in your network. And in fact, if you study it long enough with this data, you can show how it's supposed to be operating and then come to find out anything that works differently. It's easy to see. Our IT team uses the same set of data as I do. We're hunting for adversaries. They're hunting to figure out how their applications talk to each other. And that's the IT team. They're the ones that put them in. And of course, it, the whole point is to avoid breach. The whole point is to stop the damage before the bleeding goes. So in the end, the three asks are to achieve, ironically, and I did not plan this, I didn't pay them any, any euros in order to actually ask the three questions that you did, those exact three purposes. That's my challenge to all of you within the next year. I've probably got minus five minutes for questions. I'm suspecting that somebody of the three people in the front of me, four now four of me in the, uh, in the front of me are gonna tell me this. I'll be happy to take one or two questions if appropriate. If not, I'll get off the stage. Paul, no, you no, tell you me. Go, you've got uh, five minutes. If people wanna ask questions, please ask questions. Alex? By the way, it sounds like a haunted house in here. Can everybody hear that whistling? <laughs> yeah, good morning. Luke Willems, Dimension Data. Uh, thank you for a, a great presentation. Um, I would like to ask a question out of the box. Take a leap of uh, faith. Uh, forget that you are a vendor. Um, I do that regularly. Okay, good. Uh, consider that you have a considerable budget, huh? a crowdfunding miracle, and then you can decide um, what to do with it for the purpose of cyber defense. So what would you do? Would you build a new computer? Would you build a parallel internet with trusted users? Would you make uh, a cyber lab better than Breaking Bad? What would you do if you had that, 
that money and no vendor relations, no such, somebody says, okay, what is missing in the cyber defense world? You have the budget, what would you put in place? I think the most, it, standing here today, though I don't think it's ideal, um, where I would apply as much energy as possible is basically putting a huge systematized shield in front of as many businesses as possible that can see the same set of data that I can. Um, the reason I say that, we've talked just a couple of years ago over the fact that there aren't nearly enough security professionals in the world. There's some a million, you know, sort of person shortage. So I can't advance, even if I built a new technology, I can't really advance it at scale globally to reduce the amount of success that the adversary techniques are having just by building a tech and selling it, right? So I, that's not, in my opinion, going to work. We're always going to have new creation, new innovation. I get that part. But I don't think it instantly causes a reaction, number one. So number two is, if that's not going to work, then what would I do next? It would be to create essentially this shield where everybody could buy in that would reduce the friction and reduce a ton of noise. To a certain degree, it's why I think OpenDNS was such a smart move. You'll notice I'm not talking about a parallel internet. We can try that, but I, I'm fairly convinced that some cross-connection plus some I didn't know, and then pretty soon it's the next internet, and pretty soon we're right back where we were. I've seen this movie before. In the U.S., it was called Nipper to Sipper to JWix to then a privatized to NSA net, and essentially we always built another network in order to figure out the other networks were not, not safe enough, and then that network got hit, and then, of course, we had to build another network, and we just keep going. So I don't feel confident that that's, in fact, the next mode. Um, and then the third, of course, is not building a new computing system. Um, it took us th arguably 30 years to get into the space that we are right now, sort of late 80s, if you will, um, into now for the internet age. And to switch gears and just suddenly think that a new operating system, a new hardware architecture, et cetera, is going to, again, get to scale, might be generations away. I'm not convinced about it either. We need to actually stop this within a five-year period affect it within a 10-year period, not 30 years, not 50 years. So I would go for the umbrella concept. How, in fact, could all of us subscribe to something that helps us immensely with so little friction that it's easy to turn on? That would be what I would spend all the money and energy against. That, by the way, is only because I was told we can't finance an internet mafia. If we could, I'd probably finance them to go after all the guys that are actually annoying us and just start causing that to have kinetic effect. But I'm told that's not allowed, so I guess I've already reduced it to the second choice. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Well, thank you for all, your all right. I appreciate the time. Thank you very much, Neo, to my hosts and colleagues. Certainly appreciate it, and I'll talk to you soon. On behalf of the uh, nice. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Brilliant.